Welcome okay. to the CMIA special fireside chat with uh, Captain Colin Pasuchuk. We're going to be talking about IPUE and the urban environment. Okay, so as I kind of mentioned already while we were waiting for the PowerPoint to load up, um, the problem that I found with the way that IPB is being conducted for the urban battle space is um, it just really hasn't been sufficiently updated for uh, military operations there. Um, there has been a lot of literature on it. Um, perhaps one of the best ones for um, IPB in the urban environment is by uh, Russell, or, um, uh, yeah, Russell Gwen and um, Medicine Joe Medby, or sorry, Jameson Joe Medby, um, uh, titled Street Smart. Um, IPB in the uh, in the urban environment um, that was published in about <laughs> apologize for the dogs um, that was published around 2000 um, and it had a lot of really good um, advice and, and uh, tools that you can implement but it too is a bit dated um, so I used that kind of as a starting point and then started looking at it in more detail based on what technology we have available today so again the aim of this paper and this presentation is to you know um, discuss the doctrinal and environmental challenges to intelligence preparation um, and offer some prescriptive solutions for overcoming these challenges. Doctrinal references, uh, basically I looked at um, the English speaking world, Canada, the United States, UK, and uh, NATO in particular. Australian doctrine is really in a state of flux um, and they don't really have a uh, consistent manual to go off of um, and, um, and NATO as well, obviously. Okay, so the urban environment and the urban quad versus the urban triad. So the urban triad has been in doctrine for quite a while. Um, the NATO urbanization capstone project added a fourth component to create an urban quad and that's the uh, uh, information terrain. Um, we can definitely have a conversation about whether or not information terrain is a distinct feature of the urban environment or is a feature of all environments that we operate in. Um, but right now it's neither here nor there. Uh, something we can talk about later but when it comes to the type of operations that we're working in um quite obviously for major combat operations commanders are going to be a lot more concerned with the physical terrain um that they're facing and the enemy that they're facing there but when you start merging into peace support and counterinsurgency operations the focus is obviously going to shift to more towards the human terrain that we have in a given environment so the recommendations that I present here, um, they really can't necessarily be seen as a one size fits all for every type of operation. You're going to have to pick and choose what, um, uh, what tools you really emphasize and focus on based on the type of uh, campaign that we're trying to operate with. Some of the doctrinal challenges that I teased out, first off, starting with uh, physical terrain analysis. The current methods that we use for terrain analysis, Flowcark, really aren't very good for depicting that multi-dimensional uh, topography of, um, of the urban environment. Um, furthermore, current methods of terrain categorization like the uh, commercial ribbon or the urban core or the residential doesn't really provide any added value to lower echelon commanders. There's not a lot of analytical value to that. Um, so I present a different way of, of looking at it and we'll talk about that shortly. When it comes to human terrain and infrastructure analysis, the current methods that we use, uh, PMESI, your political, military, economic, um, social information infrastructure, uh, vaguely seen as your uh, operational variables. And then A scope, um, areas, structures, capabilities, organizations, people, events, um, your civil um, uh, variables, as the Americans call them, they're very superficial. Um, and even when you use the PMESI A scope crosswalk or matrix or whatever you call it, it's really, hard to, de uh, sorry, to depict the systemic linkages uh, between various aspects of the, uh, of the civil environment. Um, <clears throat> as it is written in our doctrine right now, um, it's difficult to make these, or to figure out what these linkages are. But um, again, I have a proposal for that. The IPOE process itself, like I said earlier, it remains valid, but the big problem is in steps three and four, when you start looking at the civil environment they really have a tendency to deny civil actors agency um, as rational um, actors in an environment and it then denies them uh, their influence on military operations both friendly and enemy by only focusing on uh, threat evaluation and threat coas we ignore a large large part of the um, operating environment 
the environmental challenges. I kind of broke this down into knowing the terrain and knowing the enemy. And that was a little bit deliberate because we're really focused on um, developing knowledge of the environment. So part of the problem of urban terrain is that that topography really degrades high-end sensors and it complicates ISR and collection activities. Um, the presence of rooftops make it quite obviously very difficult to peer inside of buildings. That urban topography itself is also constantly changing from hour to hour, uh, day to day, uh, barricades move, um, rubble is created, buildings are destroyed. Um, <clears throat> so that constant change makes it very, very difficult to maintain situational awareness of, um, of the operating environment. And then the density, the sheer density and diversity of features increases the amount of information that we need to analyze. And at the same time, obviously it overwhelms our ability to operationalize all of that information. It's extremely time consuming to do terrain analysis in, de in detail in an urban environment. And it's manpower intensive as well. Then knowing the enemy. Um, <clears throat> so like I mentioned in the previous slide there, civilian population groups, they have agency and they will act on their interests and their survival strategies complicating threat identification. They will use attack, defend and exploit infrastructure depending on what their survival strategies are. And that obviously will complicate their interdependencies with infrastructure. And it's really quite difficult to understand those interdependencies when you're only looking at it in a very superficial manner. Civilians will also provide camouflage and concealment for adversaries in the environment. And again, complicating that threat identification. And because of the way that we conduct warfare, um, very much in line with the Geneva Conventions and rules of engagement, it demands much greater target precision. I think we can all take a look at the news and see what's happening in Ukraine right now and understand that the Russians obviously do not have these scruples in any sense. So recommended adjustments to IPOE. Again, these are just the recommendations that I propose in the article here. Um, no change to the actual, you know, the number of steps, but when we get to steps three and four, kind of changing how we approach them rather than, you know, what, they're, what they actually are. So really no change to step one, defining the operating environment. Step two, we're still uh, describing the operating environment's effects. But in step two, I'm proposing a new method for terrain analysis, but also using the full ASCOPE PMESI estimate process as it was originally designed by the US Marine Corps for their civil affairs. Step three, we're expanding it. So it's not just evaluating the adversary or evaluating the threat, but we're also evaluating relevant influences. So in here, we propose a new method of evaluation of civil, uh, civil actors. And then step four, really kind of for lack of a better term, developing non-Canadian courses of action. Here, we're not just looking at adversary courses of action, but we're looking at the courses of action available for significant population groups within the environment. So I'm not gonna go through the four, you know, the four steps of, of um, IPB. One of the assumptions I have is that uh, people listening in have a bit of understanding of how that process works but I'm gonna focus in instead on the uh, recommended adjustments to IPB. My computer's slowing down a little bit, okay. So starting off with physical terrain analysis in step two of IPOE. Oops, sorry, I went too far. Okay, so this isn't to say that Flowcark, uh, you know, analyzing the features, lanes, um, objectives, um, canalizing terrain, um, avenues of approach and rating the avenues of approach at, at key terrain as well. Um, that's not to say that this is um, inappropriate or ineffective. We're still going to do it, um, but we're gonna look at the underlying terrain and do flow card for that. We're not really gonna use flow card to figure out buildings because quite frankly, um, the way Flocark ends up being overlaid on an urban area is buildings end up being de depicted as um, heavily restricted terrain, um, when in actuality, those are mobility corridors for types of forces moving through them. So it doesn't really get to the, um, uh, it doesn't really accurately depict an urban environment. But we're still going to do it because the underlying terrain has some very important um, impacts on uh, settlement patterns. Okay, so we take a look at that first, the number one there, that underlying terrain analysis. As we 
carry on here and go from you know one to seven, we go from very, very general things to much, much more detailed things. So the cool thing about this, when we tried it out um, at 3VP and it kind of worked, is that it scales really nicely depending on the echelon. So higher echelons can do the first few steps, pass off mapping products and, and analysis to lower echelons, and they can carry on with that mapping process in much more detail in their specific areas of operation. So after doing the, under, the uh, underlying terrain analysis, we look at the broad settlement patterns, things like um, satellite pattern, hub and spoke, um, linear patterns, that sort of thing, um, because those will have important impact on how forces maneuver around and through urban areas. <clears throat> A great example right now um, in the current uh, conflict in Ukraine is the city of Kherson. Kherson backs onto the Dnieper River, uh, which runs, you know, um, uh, east to west on the uh, southern side of the city. And it has a very, very important and major impact on how military forces are able to maneuver and work around that city. And we have to make deductions about what those, um, what those broad sediment patterns will do. From there, we move down to uh, urban terrain zones. And here we are relying on some work done from the um, uh, US um, Army University, actually. Um, in developing these urban terrain zones. And I'll show you on the next slide that I accidentally uh, went to what this actually kind of looks like. But this is a much more nuanced and much more effective way of organizing um, urban terrain features than just saying, you know, this is a commercial ribbon or this is a high rise area. Those types of terms don't have, they don't carry much analytical value. And frankly, when you pass that down to a subordinate commander, they can't do much with that. But the cool thing about these urban terrain zones is that they are made up of geotypical building types. So what we can do um, by using geomatic products, we can take a look at what the building types are in a given area, and we can make some assumptions so that rather than analyzing every single building and every single room in that building, we can make some more informed assumptions about what those types of buildings will be like. So then we can pass that down to a subordinate commander and they have some planning assumptions that they can go off of to develop their tactical plans. After that, we take a look at the street patterns because street patterns will have very important impacts, again, on how forces can maneuver through a city. Um, <clears throat> and we look at that kind of in tandem with uh, subterranean uh, patterns. One thing that we kind of need to wrap our minds around in an urban environment is that um, your subterranean and your surface areas really they make up a contiguous operating environment because I can move from the subterranean to the surface and back to the subterranean again to develop and build my movement corridors um, to infiltrate given areas. So we really got to look at those in tandem together. And then last, we take a look at structure types in a lot more detail. And really it's not a division um, or it's not the ASIC that's, that's doing this. You're looking at much more subordinate uh, levels of command that are looking at the individual building types here. So that's what I mean when I say that this can scale from the more general to the more detail. Last, you develop a mod uh, the modified combined obstacle overlayer, the MAKU, and really it's not going to look like one single, uh, uh, one single map overlay. There's just way too much information to convey, but the purpose of, of putting this in here is that it's going to um, really the end result is the necessary mapping products that commanders need in order to make their plans, whatever they may look like for the given environment. It won't always look exactly the same depending on the environment we're operating in. Again, for major combat operations, we're gonna be focused on things um, much more different than in um, counterinsurgency operations. The example that I've got here of these urban terrain zones, we did this for the town of Zekni in, um, Latvia, um, my team at 3PP CLI, as well as the uh, uh, one CER geomatics team, uh, we put this together to kind of convey what these urban terrain zones kind of look like. So if we take a look at the, just as an example, the one on the uh, south side here, that large purple blob that aligns with the uh, DC3, detached, closely spaced houses. Knowing that, the nice thing about the urban terrain zones manual that this is pulled from is that in that terrain zone, it comes with uh, lists of, again, geotypical building types. So in that manual, it has 
floor plans, construction materials, um, all sorts of information about the types of buildings that would be found within this terrain zone. So again, it gives us some better information to go off of to make uh, reasonable assumptions about the terrain that we're operating in, which is kind of the, the real value of using urban terrain zones. And it really didn't take us very long to do this. It took a couple hours at most um, to scratch this all down on a map. Uh, we passed the hard copy talc over to uh, the geomatics team. They plugged it in, created a KML file, which we could then fine tune um, using a Google suite. Um, is actually quite easy to do. But even this, um, compared to the geomatics tools that the Americans are bringing online, um, this pales in comparison to what they can do, to be honest with you. Okay, moving on to human train analysis. So this is actually really simple, and I don't really take credit for coming up with anything fantastically insightful here. Um, what we have in Doctrine is on the left side, the A-scope messy crosswalk. And like I said at the beginning, quite frankly, it's insufficient. It's really superficial. Um, really, all you're doing is you're plotting data points um, without actually analyzing or making sense of those data points. So my recommendation is simple. Just turn it, just use it as an estimate as the Marines, the US Marine Corps, who developed it, intended. Um, so like I said, it's, it's not a, a fantastically insightful idea, but it makes sense if you're going to <clears throat> try to figure out the interconnections between various different factors, you need to actually go through the factor consideration deduction process um, that, we, um, uh, that we rely on as a planning tool in the Canadian Army. Infrastructure analysis. And this is why we really need to use the, um, uh, the Pemesi A scope, not as the crosswalk, but as an actual estimate process because infrastructure is very, very complex. Um, your physical infrastructure is that basis on which good services, capital information are all delivered. And that has legal and illicit flows as well. Um, all services, including essential services, really require three components. And I should, I should note that I didn't come up with this either. Um, this is actually the um, uh, Red Cross that uh, developed a manual uh, for urban operations, um, civilian considerations. And they came up with this and you know what, it really resounded with me. So I would really recommend that when we take a look at our um, doctrine when it comes to infrastructure analysis, we really hoist this on board. All services require people, hardware, and consumables. Whether those services happen to be legal, like water delivery, for example, or illegal, like drug trafficking, they all require roughly the same things. By understanding these interconnections between people, hardware, consumables, we can begin to understand um, how those interconnections create the flow of goods, services, capital, and information, not only inside the urban environment, but uh, between urban environments. Um, <clears throat> the categories that I have there on the right-hand side, um, most countries, especially Western countries, they have categories of critical infrastructure that they um, use for their national emergency planning. Um, and really what I've done here is I've kind of tried to um, I could, um, collect these, uh, these lists together um, into you know, one coherent list. Uh, I'm sure someone can probably take a look at this and say, well, no, no, well you're missing this, you're missing that. Um, and maybe so, but uh, it's just, again, a recommended approach to, uh, to taking a look at critical infrastructure categories. In the third step, okay, so this is where we start um, a few bigger recommended changes to how we approach IPB in an earth or RPOE in an urban environment, we need to take a look at civilian population groups and understand what they want, how they want to live and how military operations impact them. But not only that, how they begin to impact uh, military operations. So yeah, we took a look at this already in step two when we we're going through the ASCOPE PMESI estimate process, but here we're only gonna look at the groups that have the abilities to significantly influence military operations, whether friendly or enemy. And we're gonna take a closer look at evaluating them. The first part of this is we do a capability assessment. This isn't much different than looking at a threat, but we start looking at different things. Um, the article uh, in the figures of the article, it's got you know, the tables of the sorts of things that we look at, but we need to understand what these groups are actually capable of doing. Step two, we take a look at their interests. Um, 
This comes from uh, Dr. Jacob Stoyle, who um, wrote an article a few years ago, I think 2016, 2016 or 2017, about um, looking at this, looking at civilian groups in a lot more detail in terms of what their actual interests are, where their interests align and where they diverge from our interests. And look at and understand the sorts of um, red flag moments that can occur between groups where all of a sudden a, um, an ally suddenly turns into an adversary. Um, this happened numerous times in Afghanistan and it took us quite a while to try and figure out and understand why these sorts of things were happening um, because we weren't really looking at what these groups' interests were. We looked at them in terms of whether they're you know, pro-government or anti-government, but that's a very, very... Um, uh, simple uh, way of looking at it, and it really obscures um, what these groups' actual interests are. Because then we start looking at what their survival strategies are. There's a variety of different ways groups will try to survive conflict. Um, and when you throw in a foreign actor, like the Canadian military, for example, um, how these groups then start responding is, can be very, very difficult for us to perceive if we don't have a frame to understand them. Unfortunately, the counterinsurgency framework that we you know, rely on um, tends to reduce them to pro or anti-government groups. But there's a lot of different ways that groups can try to survive. Um, one really, uh, uh, a really good example is hedging, for example, where a given family will send one son to serve with the national military and another son to serve with an insurgency group. What they're basically trying to do there is play the odds, hoping that um, uh, by um, appeasing both groups, they will um, avoid the negative impact of siding with one and not the other. Um, but that's very, very difficult and a lot of times for us to actually understand um, what those groups are actually doing. Because a lot of times to us, it might just look like they're being treasonous and that's not exactly the case. And then we have to place them on the spectrum of relative interest in terms of, you know, maybe some of them are allies. Some of them could be accomplices. On the other end, you've got absolute adversaries, but then you have obstacles. Why we need to understand what their interests are is because we can keep a group as an obstacle in a given operating environment and still achieve our mission. But if we should do something that turns that group into an adversary, then achieving our mission becomes much, much more difficult. Um, one could use uh, Port-au-Prince, Haiti, as an example. There are numerous uh, criminal gangs uh, operating in Port-au-Prince right now. Um, should, for example, a non-combatant evacuation operation need to be launched there, um, the CAF could get the mission done while keeping those groups as obstacles. But if we do something that would turn those groups into adversaries or just one of those groups into an adversary, completing the mission could be extremely difficult. So understanding what these groups' interests are is really important for uh, mission success. Last, we have co-development of these population groups. And really the inspiration I took for this is functional analysis. Um, it's a really useful tool uh, for code development for, um, uh, for threats. So I tried to apply it to civilian groups as well. It doesn't work perfectly, um, but some of the fundamentals can definitely be used. So the first step here is we identify a group's likely end state based on their strategy, their survival strategy and their interests. That's why figuring out what their survival strategy is, is so important because it allows you to make um, more predictive and more reasonable assumptions about what their end state might be. We identify the tactics that they would use to achieve this end state, and this could be a variety of things. Um, they might be on the physical or psychological plane, offensive, defensive, violent, or nonviolent um, tactics like political maneuvering, for example. Last, identify their capabilities and, and or the forces necessary, necessary to execute those tasks. Um, <clears throat> there are likely flaws in this approach. There are likely uh, blind spots and gaps in this approach, um, but it is a lot better than what we are currently doing, which is nothing. I um, apologize for the uh, the typo on the slide. It's supposed to be sit. Oh no, I did spell it right. Sit temp. I just can't read. Um, but uh, in any event, the uh, 
this villain cola could be depicted using a sit temp like the uh, uh, a map overlay with the um, expression of you know their their intent their main effort scheme maneuver etc but that's not necessarily always the case maybe it's better presented simply as text um, it's really hard to say depends on the environment depends on the operation depends on a lot of variables okay so that kind of sums up the recommendations that I have for um, modifying and, and improving IPOE in an urban environment. I do have some uh, controversial points, and then not all of them made it into the article. Um, but one of the um, more controversial points I have is that mission analysis in step one of IPOE. It does introduce some artificial biases that, by design, actually delimits analysis to only those factors relevant to the mission. Um, it will ascribe importance to some actors, or sorry, some factors, but not others. The problem there is that in so doing, you can lose sight of the interconnectedness, interconnectedness of many environmental factors, like interconnections between people and infrastructure. So there's a bias there. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It just needs to be understood that it's there. Uh, the next thing is that our current train analysis models they're designed to support maneuver warfare, conditions for which are really rarely, if ever, generated in urban environments. Usually, um, warfare in urban environments descends into positional siege warfare, um, and that's been his, you know, the case historically. There are very few cases where um, you can actually generate um, maneuver in an urban environment. The last one is that there are inherent cultural biases in the IP, IPOE process, and they've been there for many, many years. Um, viewing civil groups merely as battlefield effects, it denies their agency as rational, competent actors. And as I say here, you know, it fails to grasp how these groups will influence military operations in urban environments, but really in any environment. Some future research directions. Some things that we just don't have a good handle on. Um, train analysis for slums. They are, many people describe them as being random. Uh, they're not. There is a logic to how slums develop. Um, and we need to get a better understand uh, or understanding of how they develop uh, to better understand the terrain that's actually there. Um, integrating geospatial intelligence and new mapping technologies. Um, I just saw on Twitter today the, uh, who was it, combined arms. Um, training center in the United States. Um, they're practicing with uh, augmented reality to create a three-dimensional uh, map model of an urban environment that people can walk through. Incredible, great stuff, really neat. Um, drones can be used for three-dimensional mapping and three-dimensional uh, three rendering of urban environments as well. Um, these things are on the market and they're available right now. Um, next point is a more thorough and ap an applicable method of population and cultural analysis. Um, I believe what I'm presenting is a bit of a stopgap solution. Um, it's not the, the, the perfect solution. I don't think we'll ever get there, but we can definitely improve on this. And I think more research and more um, interest needs to be uh, placed there. And then last, integration of complex adaptive systems theory into IPOE. Um, this has been been done to a point. Um, there is a concept of complex IPB uh, that was trialed in the US Army. Um, the problem with it, though, is that it really demands a big change to how IPB is conducted. And there's really not a lot of support for changing the process very much. So we really do need to look at ways to um, integrate this theory into doing IPOE. Um, some of the answers might actually be technological in terms of um, uh, turning towards uh, machine learning and uh, other forms of artificial intelligence. Um, but that's definitely an area that, uh, that we need to take a look at for sure. So that's about it. Um, I'll turn the floor back to uh, Lieutenant Colonel Holtz for uh, any questions. And uh, before I do, though, I just want to say thank you to you know, everyone who uh, um, uh, took the time to read the article. I really appreciate that. Um, and I'm really excited to, uh, uh, to see any questions that you might have. So, so Colin, well, can we get you to stop sharing your video? Yep. Or your screen, sorry. There we go. There we go. We Perfect. still don't see you. Your, your camera's still not working. I don't know what's up. Yeah, that's weird. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so yeah, I have the uh, the list of people here, the list of participants. Uh, I am not 100% sure how you raise your hand uh, on this thing, or if you can, but um, if if somebody does know how to do that and they want to ask a question to Colin, uh, the, oh, Brad, Bradford, yeah, you did it. You figured it out. Uh, go ahead. Okay, yeah, I just need to figure out how to unmute myself now. Um, actually, I was just pointing out raising hands is down in the reactions uh, emoji down at the bottom of your screen. Uh, aside from that, all I want to say is I'm, I'm really impressed. I've uh, moved away from a lot of IPOE and what I've been doing for the last few years, but this really has brought back a lot of discussions that we've had, and thank you very much for formalizing all of it. Well, thank you. All right, great, great comment, uh, Brad. Um, anybody else with a, a comment? I do see a so comment. There's a comment in the, the, the chat there about uh, your opinion on leveraging uh, technology and IA to uh, do, a, to I guess, facilitate this process. Yeah, so that's, that's an interesting question. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, who is it? Dr. Anthony King at um, University of Warwick in the United Kingdom, um, fresh off of publishing his book on urban warfare in the 21st century. The next project he's working on is big data and integrating big data into our understanding of urban environments. Um, I've had a couple conversations with him about it, and it's absolutely fascinating um, research that he's moving into. Um, he's of the mind that it might be of more strategic to operational value where big data um, is actually at. And I, I posed him the, the possibility that it could actually have you know, tactical value as well. Using the example in the, um, oh geez, it was in the summer in Eastern Ukraine when I think it was Wagner Group. It could have been Russian regulars. No, it was Wagner. Um, one of their members posted a picture on Telegram, and the picture happened to have the address of the building they were using as a headquarters um, in the background. And within a couple of days, the Ukrainians um, launched an artillery strike on that building and um, knocked it out. Unconfirmed number of uh, uh, Wagner mercenaries killed, but it was definitely an effective strike. And um, were that to be integrated into a, um, a machine learning algorithm that could um, crawl across social media platforms to collect that sort of information and find that sort of data within photographs and videos that are posted, um, it could have very real tactical um, impact. Um, and I just, I see that as being really, really, I mean, there's an enormous field of data available for integration and, and, and using machine learning um, to pull together for IPOE, especially in the train analysis. Um, we have things like uh, uh, Google Street View, for example, um, pulling all of that data together. A really neat thing about a lot of mapping, uh, online mapping programs is that uh, users can um, post pictures as well. All of that information, open source and freely available, could be integrated into that level of terrain analysis. Um, there's really some fascinating ways in that regard. Um, when it comes to cultural analysis as well, uh, there's, there's a great deal of data there, but as far as teaching the machine what's right and what's wrong, that's a very complicated thing. And um, I'm, I'm certainly no data scientist, and I can't really speak to how we would get over those uh, those challenges, but it is a fascinating field of study for sure. And I think it could definitely have some uh, some very effective uh, use in you know urban IPOE. Yeah, that's that's a great answer, Colin. Um, so there's a question from Dustin, but before we take that question, I just want to remind everybody that this is so everything that Colin said was speculative in nature, and um, uh, just remind everybody, this is an unclassified presentation. So if you have specific knowledge about those types of things, uh, they're not necessarily to be best shared in this particular venue. So Dustin, go ahead with your question. 
Yeah, thank you. I much appreciated the presentation uh, being newer to the branch. Uh, um, so I'm not too sure how this uh, question will come across, but I'm just curious uh, to know the perspective on the time factor of the urban environment in terms of maybe the flow or if that's been looked at from like uh, those outlying sort of detached home areas and sort of urban flow, workflow, time factors and, and flow of traffic, that type of thing. If you could comment on that. Thank yeah, you. That's, that's a great question. Everything gets slower. Um, everything becomes much more methodical and um, sequential when you're doing urban operations, especially when it comes to um, uh, major combat operations in an urban environment. The problem from the intelligence perspective is twofold. Um, first, you have an enormous amount of information that is available um, that has to be integrated into planning processes. Um, but on the flip side, you do not have nearly enough staff resources, capabilities to actually process and operationalize all of that information. So you're on the one end, you're completely overwhelmed. Um, even if you had the, all the, the perfect tools, you're completely overwhelmed. And then you just don't have enough to, uh, to actually make any sense of it. Um, when it comes to planning, um, that's a good example. Fallujah, for example, the intelligence planning for that began like for the second battle of Fallujah, the intelligence planning for that began at least uh, during the first battle. And there was a six to seven month gap, I believe, between the first and second battles of Fallujah. Um, I mean, there's a lot of factors that go into um, why the Americans were successful in the, in the second battle versus the, the first. But um, that planning time, like their intelligence staff took all of it um, to develop the products necessary to enable the maneuver plan there. So it, it's excruciatingly time consuming um, to analyze that environment. It's easier in major combat operations. It's awful in uh, counterinsurgency operations because not only do you have the um, um, an enormous amount of work to build your, uh, your baseline information, but then things change so quickly that you have to keep on top of that as well. Um, so yeah, we're not, our current structures aren't really um, um, operationalized for urban environments, but we know what those problems are and they're ta we're task organized even in, in the intelligence side as well for the operating environment. So we can um, ramp up or ramp down as required. Right? I don't know, I, I hope that kind of answered the question that you had there. Yes, thank you. Oh, yeah, that was great. Uh, so Colin, there's another question in the uh, meeting chat and I think we'll try to keep this to the last one. And then I still have three more questions for Colin. We were gonna try and keep this to uh, 45 minutes, but I think we're going to go to about an hour. Uh, so what was the genesis of your work? Um, and and it goes on to say, what was was it to uh, your deployment to Latvia or work with our allies or perception in the changing uh, battlefield and impacts of the urban environment? So that's question one, if you can answer that one relatively quickly. Um, oh, geez. Well, I haven't been to I haven't been to Latvia. Um, why we chose Latvia for that, um, for the examples is, uh, we wanted to do something that was operationally relevant. Um, our sister battalion, one PPCLI, they, um, were ramping up for deployment. So we figured we'd help them while helping ourselves. Um, so really that was kind of the, uh, the genesis of that example in particular. I hope that answered that question. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. And then the second question, uh, what's the next step in your research? Um, the comment from Rob is that changing doctrine seems like a hard hill to climb. Um, and do you see formalizing any of this? So Colin, before you answer that question, I have to say that like, uh, you know, depending on how this video comes out, I hope we can share this with at least CFSMI and the Army Staff College. Uh, you know, we do urban IPOE um, on BD BDX3, and it would be great to have some of this information or portions of your presentation for the students to watch. Um, and definitely, you know, while it might seem like doctrine is a hard hill to climb, I think that there's some really good stuff in here that needs to be incorporated into what we uh, we do. And I and I think that there's opportunity space to change doctrine. Um, th these are not significant changes. This is stuff we just need to do. So uh, what's the next step in your research? Yeah, um, great question. And 
uh, one thing that I really want to focus in on is um, trade analysis and understanding of slums and shanty towns. Um, as I kind of mentioned in a few slides ago, that's one area that we don't really have a good understanding of. And it's um, one area that is, you know, when you look at urbanization, um, the spread of slums and the number of people living in them, it's only increasing every year. Um, and it is likely going to be one of our operating environments sometime in the future. Um, so that's kind of where I'm kind of the next step that I'm going to look at when it comes to influencing doctrine. I guess really the only thing I can do is keep, uh, keep talking about this, keep talking to the right people about it. And um, maybe eventually somebody will listen. We're listening. <laughs> We're listening. Um, hey, so Colin, I have a couple of uh, notes for you on uh, how things went tonight. So just a quick, quick, uh, points. So uh, you talked about objectives in Flowcark. We are changing that. That is now going to become obstacles. Um, oh, that's great. Major White is uh, <laughs> working up uh, something on that. So I think that'll change shortly. Um, the core director, Colonel Menard, directed that we will change that. That's It's a done deal. Um, that's good. That's been one of my pet peeves for a while. Is it? Mine too. Yeah. I have a real pet peeve. Um, and I, I noticed you talked about functional analysis. I'm, I'm interested to, and maybe this is an offline thing, but I'm interested to, to uh, understand more about how you're using it because we are now using that at the Army Staff College in terms of IPOE Step 3. Yeah. And uh, I, I would just like to make a comment that, you know, like in my experience with IPOE and, it, and on your presentation, you talked about Steps 1 through 4. Uh, so the IPOE process, though, in my humble opinion, really at step four is where we start. Um, step four is the beginning of, of the process in some ways, because uh, everything is about now measuring the outputs to determine what the enemy is actually going to do based on your uh, possible uh, solutions that you've built. So you talked about uh, whether you needed a sit temp for the civil side, how could you not have a sit temp if you're measuring, if you want to analyze the civil side you have to measure the civil side. Therefore, you need a sit temp, which is going to go into your event template and support uh, at some point your decision support template. Um, uh, sorry, decision support matrix, because if something happens on the civil side, well, the commander has already has to have some preconditions in place to deal with those activities um, and you need to measure them. So I can't imagine we couldn't do anything but have a sit temp for various civil considerations if that's the way we're going. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree with that. Um, and it was something that I was kind of wrangling with uh, when I was writing the article is some of them are difficult to convey on a sit temp, but then how do you war game them out against um, uh, friendly and enemy courses of action as well if you're not using a standardized, um, and not necessarily format, but at least standardized approach to conceiving of their um, their courses of action, um, so yeah, no, I, I I agree with you. On yeah, that well, answer. it it all goes to the collection. Like e even if that sit temp isn't a <laughs> like you said, even if it's a word product, it drives our collection requirements. That is the yeah. principle, and that's why you know it it doesn't stop at step step four in terms of coas. It's all about how do we now measure and then. Uh, and that measurement is in our collection, which then drives uh, decision making. So, and I find that we're not as good at that part of IPOE as we really uh, need to be. And, and that's a big improvement we need to make. So Colin, my last three questions, uh, hardest one first. Uh, right. What's your favorite movie? I'm a big Guy Ritchie fan. I'd have to say Snatch. Snatch, interesting. And, and why is that? Um, oh, geez. <laughs> Mostly because it's vulgar, I suppose. Um, <laughs> it's a great, it, it's a fun story. Let's put it that way. The okay. way everything connects at the end, it's a, it's a fun story to follow. All right. All right. That's an excellent. Uh, so, and second question, um, what, uh, what book are you currently reading? Okay. So I, I actually just finished reading um, Dr. Anthony King's newest book, Urban Warfare in the 21st Century. Okay. Um, the next book on my list is something that I ought to have finished a very long time ago. Um, I keep trying, but I can't, I uh, can't quite finish it. It's uh, Francis Fukuyama's um, uh, 
Origins of Political Order. Um, mm. It's an enormous book. It's a big read. It's a lot to get through, but um, it's a really fascinating story about, well, not really story, um, history of how political order has developed across numerous um, um, civilizations and societies. Okay. Wow. And do you, and do you recommend King's book, by the way? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. It It's one of those, it, after reading it, it really reformed and reshaped how I thought about the urban environment and operations in the urban environment. Between that and um, uh, Dave Kilcullen's book, um, Out of the Mountains, um, I can't remember the subtitle of it, but it's Out of the Mountains. Um, those two books are, are outstanding for understanding the urban environment. Right. Okay. Um, and last question for you is, um, uh, the, uh, uh, tell us something about yourself that, uh, most people don't know. Well, this is the hardest question. No, it, that's not a hard question. I, I mean, most I people don't to, know I try to be anyway, as, so. Yeah, I know. I try to be as open as possible. So, um, all right. I have two small children. Um, yeah one three, one six, um, between those two and my wife, they're the love of my life. And one of them is staring at me right now, laughing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, you know what, that's kind of the most special things for me. Okay. Well, that, that's a great answer. You know, that's almost the exact same answer that uh, general Goulet gave when I asked him that question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Hey, so Colin, thank you very much. Thank you for everybody that attended as well.